Hello, welcome to the Ukrainian Studies Organization at Indiana University. I'm Natalia Shpilova Said, and thank you so much for joining us today. Today, we have the opportunity to speak with Timofi Brik. Timofi Brik is the director of the Center for Sociological Studies at Kyiv School of Economics. Prior to this appointment, he was a Fulbright visiting scholar at New York University 2019 and 2020 and a visiting Vucic fellow at the Stanford Center for Russian, East European and Eurasian Studies in 2018. He's also an editor at Vox Ukraine and a board member of CEDOS. His paper on religious supply in Ukraine published in the Sociology of Religion journal won the Best Young um, Sociologist in Ukraine Award in 2018. So we'll start with the lecture. Timofey Brick's talk today is 30 years of religious pluralism in Ukraine from early revivals to the pandemic. Please submit your comments and questions via our Q&A option. All questions and comments will be addressed during our discussion. And you can also use function raise hand and participate in our discussion directly. Uh, at this point, I would like to uh, welcome uh, Timothy Brick and thank you so much for joining us today. Well, what can I say? Thank you for having me. It's an honor. Uh, I think your department is doing a lot of great work uh, you know, in terms of uh, research of Ukraine and, and providing this platform for the Ukrainian researchers to speak about the studies and uh, their agenda. So thank you very much also for inviting myself. Um, so today, my presentation will be based on the data and references that are available uh, in the book, which was published quite recently uh, from the Ukraine to Ukraine. Uh, I co-authored a chapter there with uh, Jose Casanova about religious pluralism in Ukraine. And some of the data can be found in the paper uh, about church competition in Ukraine, which was published in the Sociology of Religion. And I will also refer to some new ongoing projects. So not all of the data are available online. Uh, the papers are still uh, going through peer review process. Nevertheless, I will be happy to share some preprints or uh, data sources with uh, you upon request. So briefly, the outline of my presentation uh, is here on the slide. So yeah, I'll, I'll give this uh, overview of the 30 years of religious revivals in Ukraine from the sociological perspective. So I think it's important to mention that I'm not a historian and not a theologist. So I, I guess I will lose a lot of um, important information. So I'm not going to talk about you know, specific historical figures or maybe how people emotionally respond to religion or how they interpret Bible. So I'm not going to talk about these details. However, I'll be speaking about um, large trends that we observe in the data. The data sometimes come from statistical uh, services, sometimes from surveys. Uh, some data are available and I worked with that, but sometimes I collected my own data. So I will, I will be talking about all this. Then I will try to position uh, this empirical observations in, in a broader context of, uh, of the sociological theory. So whether Ukraine uh, confirms, the case of Ukraine confirms some sociological theories, or maybe it poses new challenges for sociological theory. And then in the end, I'll uh, be talking about uh, more practical applications. So, okay, religious pluralism is a big part of our society, but what does it mean for other social processes, for elections, uh, or even to how people react to the COVID pandemic. Um, and before I start talking about Ukraine, I will say a few words about uh, sociological uh, definitions and some broad uh, um, perspective uh, about uh, religion and secularization. So when sociologists talk about secularization, usually we mean that religion does not play this major role in secular societies anymore, that maybe in religious societies, people rely on churches when they do some daily social activities, when they decide which school to attend or which career uh, to take on. 
but in secular societies, people don't really rely on churches when they make these daily decisions. Uh, religion is not so important for political process or identities of people. Uh, and the next question, which is important to consider, is how to measure this uh, variation. So some societies can be secular, some societies can be religion, religious, but how do we know that? So usually sociologists uh, use uh, data uh, from surveys to analyze attitudes of people, their identities, beliefs in uh, God, uh, behavior such as church attendance. And we can also analyze institutions, religious groups as organizations, legislation, which is present in the society. And that's why sociologists, you know, they try to collect all this data in different countries and they debate a lot whether secularization is actually happening, whether it happens at the same pace in different countries, whether it's governed by the same mechanism, et cetera. So even though there is a lot of debate as always in science, there is never, uh, we, we in the situation with no debate. So despite the debates, still many sociologists agree that um, more Western societies that are industrialized, that have stronger state, uh, where state provide welfare and insurance to the citizens. In these societies, usually secularization is on the march, march. So meaning that generation after generation, and we call it generational replacement. So with time, people become less and less religious and more and more secular. However, this trend, as I said, is uh, observed mostly for societies that are more industrialized, uh, with better developed educational systems, welfare systems. And it's not true for all parts of the world. Um, and it's not true for Ukraine. So uh, in Ukraine and other post-communist societies, we observed what is called religious revivals, or sometimes it's also labeled as religious resurrections, meaning that after 70 years of uh, Soviet, uh, of, of the communist uh, state domination, uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, religion kind of re-emerged in post-communist societies. And this uh, screenshot is from Pew Research, is a very famous uh, NGO from the US that conducted a lot of surveys in post-communist societies. And already in 1991, they saw that quite a lot of Ukrainians, Bulgarians, Russians nominally defined themselves as religion, religious. So for instance, here on this chart, you see that in 1991, almost 40% of Ukrainians identified as Orthodox Christians. Uh, it is just a nominal identification, and yet it's quite, it was quite a, an, a jump, an increase uh, just after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And the tricky part about Ukraine and other post-communist studies is that these religious revivals, they have never stopped. Many other European societies, they experience secularization now, but countries like Ukraine, Bulgaria, uh, Russia, they're on the path of religious revivals even today. Uh, I like this graph uh, quite more, even though it's more technical, but I'll explain what's happening here. Uh, this graph, uh, represents the results of, of a statistical model. Uh, there was a survey conducted in many countries in the early 90s, but then also in late 2000s. So to the left, with these red dots, these are results for early 90s. And to the right, with these yellow dots, results for the late 2000s. And each dot represents a certain variable, uh, a variable that describes respondents and the variable that can predict uh, the likelihood that a certain individual says that they are orthodox. So for instance, in the early 90s, people with higher education and people with higher income were less likely to state that they, are, that they were orthodox. But in the late uh, 2000s, this is not the case anymore. So people who have higher education and lower education, higher income or lower income, they became equally uh, likely to say that they are orthodox. So it's not just about numbers. It's not just that 
you know, we have more people who are religious. It's also about social variables, which predicted that now people of different social demographic groups can be equally religious. So there is a certain convergence in the society, which is observed uh, with the data. So uh, with this uh, introduction, I invite you to uh, have kind of to zoom in uh, on what has been happening in Ukraine from the early 90s to present. So we talked about some larger trends. Now I'll be speaking about Ukraine in terms of uh, identities of people, their beliefs, but also uh, I will be speaking about political significance of religion and religious markets. I'll explain the meaning of this term a bit later. So Ukraine, um, just like Russia, just like Georgia, many other societies, uh, in Ukraine, a lot of people actually trust in church. So church as an institution became quite an important um, part of, of lives of many Ukrainians. So comparatively, if you ask an average Ukrainian whether they trust to the president, to parliament, to police, to courts, or to the church, quite a lot of them will say that they trust to church. So 40% of Ukrainians in 2018 said that they trust to church. And this data uh, comes from uh, the National Academy of Science Institute of Sociology. They conduct this survey uh, annually, sometimes uh, every two years. Um, so they were able to track this uh, long-term trends. And church looks like one of the most trusted institutions in Ukraine. And it's not just about how people uh, view church as organization, it's also about identities of people, whether they identify with certain religious groups. So on this table, uh, I plot percentages of Ukrainians who identify with any religion. So it could be Greek Catholicism, it could be orthodoxy, uh, some Protestantism, so any type of religion, uh, anything but atheism. Uh, so in 1992, if you, you know, if we have this time machine now and we travel back to Eastern Ukraine, somewhere in Kharkiv in 1992, and we meet 10 people and we ask uh, them about their religiosity, three out of 10 people would say that they are religious. But today, eight of these uh, 10 people would say that they are religious. So this is a quite impressive uh, change. Even though we are talking about nominal identifications, still it, it means something. Uh, interestingly, that Western Ukraine traditionally used to be quite religious uh, since the early 90s. So other parts of Ukraine, Central Ukraine, Eastern, Southern Ukraine, they kind of converged with uh, Western Ukraine by 2018. Um, Okay, so this was about identity, but we can also ask people about their actual behavior. So when we ask people during the surveys, uh, what did you do last week? Did you go to the library? Did you attend some sports? Did you attend some festi festivities? We can also ask, did you attend a church? And stably from 1994 till present, about 15% of people say that they attend churches. It looks not impressive. However, I can tell you that comparatively, when we look uh, in similar questions in Russia, for instance, or in Bulgaria, uh, fewer people attend churches regularly than in Ukraine. So this is, this is still quite a lot by the Orthodox countries' uh, standards. And then we can also look into another question. This, is, uh, this data um, comes from European Social Survey, which is a comparative survey which happens with the same design sampling methodology, same questionnaire in many European countries. So uh, I was able to you know, copy some data from there. Uh, and this question is specifically how many uh, respondents attend churches during religious celebrations like Easter or Christmas. So you see that quite a lot of Ukrainians in 2005 and 2011, we don't have more data, but in these years, quite a lot of Ukrainians attended religious uh, celebrations uh, at almost at the same level as in Greece and Bulgaria, and much more Ukrainians attended than Russians or Romanians. So what I'm trying to say is that these numbers are tricky, they can go up and they can go down with time, but comparatively, 
uh, Ukrainians attend churches quite often, even though we, we usually believe that Ukrainians are only nominally uh, uh, religious, but it seems that with time, more and more Ukrainians attend churches on important events. Uh, religious identities are still fluid in Ukraine. So this is a tricky graph. I will um, explain what's happening here. This is a quite a unique data source. Um, this is called longitudinal or panel data, which means that the same people were surveyed again and again in 2003, 2007, and 2012. So we have more than 3,000 uh, 3, respondents here. So the same people were contacted again and again, and they were asked the same question. So which, which uh, religious group uh, you, ident you identify with? And uh, you can see that there is a quite stable group of Greek Catholics. So people who identified as Greek Catholics in 2003 the same people are Greek Catholics in 2007, and the same people are Greek Catholics in 2012. So it's quite a stable group. But other people who have this label of calling themselves Orthodox, they're quite fluid. They jump from one definition to another. Maybe they say, well, they are believers, but with no particular confession, or they are Orthodox, but they don't care about uh, which Orthodox they are. Uh, and next year they call themselves uh, Moscow Patriarchat or Kiev Patriarchat Orthodox beliefs. So it seems that uh, there is a lot of fluidity and people change their identity based on circumstances. And usually these circumstances are, uh, well, correlate, they, are, they correlate with political situation in the country. And also with the role of the church and the media presence of the church and uh, the narratives that uh, particular organized religious groups are pushing for. Um, and this was the segue to start talking about politics because in Ukraine, just like in many other Orthodox uh, countries, traditionally the Orthodox church religious discourses are quite connected with the political discourses, meaning that political leaders, they usually evoke religious narratives when they speak with uh, electorate, with population, and in return, uh, churches, quite often they try to legitimize, they provide legitimacy to political leaders. So in this uh, union, they basically uh, coexist and this graph comes from the paper of my colleague, Ala Marchenko, who collected, she did, uh, she, she collected a lot of data of official statements and speeches of Ukrainian politicians. And she showed that with time, uh, more and more Ukrainian uh, official um, politicians, they evoke religious words and re religious narratives um, in when they address public. And I, I think it's, uh, people who follow Ukraine, they know that in 2015, uh, the country received Thomas, meaning that the Ukrainian Orthodox Church was recognized officially as uh, by Constantinople, and it was a very big political event in, in Ukraine, and one of the major Ukrainian politicians, uh, uh, Poroshenko, when he was running for a president, he evoked this narrative of uh, army, uh, language, faith as pillars of Ukrainian nation. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, yet again, showing how religion and uh, national narratives and political narratives can be connected in, in Ukraine. Um, so we were talking about identities and behavior of people. Then we talked about in political uh, institutions and that political power and religion are kind of connected. But there is another perspective through which we can look at religious revivals in Ukraine. And this is about religious supply. So sociologists quite often talk about religion metaphorically in terms of supply and demand. It does not mean that we really believe that religion can be reduced to this simplistic uh, economic uh, econometrical definitions, but this is a very fruitful and useful model. It allows us a lot of you know, practical exercises. We can think about religion in terms of supply and demand. So people, they have uh, demand for religiosity and churches, they are suppliers. And if we use this um, 
metaphor, we can then start collecting the data and looking in the change of religious supply over time. So this data uh, I collected from many different archives because usually it's provided at the national level, but for some years it's provided only uh, at the regional level. For some years, in order to collect the data at the, at the level of regions, I had to go to our archives and to search for all this data. Well, it was a long process, but finally we, we managed to, to have some estimates. And this is the number of officially registered parishes in Ukraine. And you see just from the first look that the number of parishes increased dramatically for all uh, organized religious groups. So it can be Orthodoxy of Moscow Patriarchate or Greek Catholics or Protestant churches, especially Protestant churches. Yes, they are small themselves, but their numbers of their parishes all, all over Ukraine increase dramatically. So when we have this increase in religious supply, it is one of the driving forces of religiosity in the country. So here I switched, uh, this is the same data, but in the table format, so you can see the numbers. Uh, and I have to say that uh, the Orthodox Church uh, of Moscow Patriarchate is still leading in the race, even though um, uh, some people were afraid of um, that this church is going to be even oppressed by the new government, which never happened. They still have a lot of parishes and these parishes are scattered all over Ukraine. And the data for the new Orthodox Church, uh, which received autocephaly after Thomas, is, um, um, is yet to be collected because we know that uh, this new church um, combined parishes of the Kievan Patriarchate and uh, Ukrainian uh, autocephalous church, but still, um, you know, uh, Still, this, this is uh, something which is in progress. So parishes, they change their affiliation even now. So we don't have a uh, nice, reliable data for this new church. So that's why I show the separate data here on this uh, table. And here I, I'd like to you know, emphasize that religious supply is one possible metric. Yeah, we can say that we had fewer parishes. Now we have more parishes. Religious supply increased. But sociologists also look into the structure of this uh, religious supply. So that's why we say religious market. You can imagine that different religious organized religious groups or churches, they are organizations. And these organizations, they have a lot of agency. They have their resources. They have their own education, media. They have their own agenda. They want to evolve and they want to progress and have more and more congregations. So they are quite active players in this game. And you can think that this market can be either monopolized or uh, fragmented. So imagine that there is one region in Ukraine where you have only Greek Catholics. So they, then we can say that there is a monopoly or if we have equal distribution of all possible religious denominations, we can say that this is a fragmented religious market. And we can measure it uh, by the index uh, called uh, Herfindahl Index, which is very often used in different uh, um, fields in economics and demography. So this index goes from zero to one, where one means maximum concentration or monopoly, and zero is the opposite, is fragmentation. And on this uh, slide, um, I calculated this index for different Ukrainian regions at the beginning of the independence. So this is 1992. And you see you have regions like Luganska Oblast, Poltavska, city of Kiev. All these dots represent different regions. And there was quite a variation. So for instance, Kiev was uh, almost 0 0.3, meaning that it was quite pluralistic in 1992. And for some reason, uh, the oblast, the region of Poltava had value 0 0.6. So it was going towards monopolization. I don't know why historically, maybe, you know, there was a lot of Orthodox Christians, but very few Protestants yet uh, appeared there, maybe, I don't know. But there was more concentration. With time, I go uh, fast forward to 2003. You see quite a lot of convergence. And now almost all regions, they moved to the left. They moved to more fragmentation and 
less concentration. Almost all regions now are in this bin of 0 0.3, 0 0.4, meaning that quite a lot of religious pluralism is happening there. And now 2016, even more to the left. Now they are from 0 0.1, 0 0.2, all oblast uh, with no exception. So these slides, they show that today in Ukraine, there is no region with religious monopoly, which is fascinating. We can we know that there are some countries that can be called, you know, uh, monopolistic. There is a Poland, which is predominantly Catholic, for instance. But in Ukraine, if you take any region, no church managed to, to, to become a, monopol a monopolist, which is fascinating. And it says a lot about the pluralistic religious market in Ukraine. So this is a very big uh, citation. I just made a screenshot from, from the chapter which uh, Jose Casanova and I uh, published. Uh, so what we want to emphasize this in this sentence that institutionally religious pluralism uh, was cemented into Ukrainian society because, well, we, uh, a new organization emerged which is called this All Ukrainian Council of Churches and Religious Organizations. So this is a special committee where the heads of all religious groups, they come together and they decide on important matters and they communicate with the state. Uh, the state also, uh, you know, historically different uh, presidents, they might have different religious preferences. Nevertheless, in the long run, no church managed to become this, uh, uh, mm, to, to achieve the status of national church. So because of this competition for the national church, uh, active competition that what is happening at the top of political game, it also allowed competition at the bottom, meaning that in all local communities, in all regions, if you travel across Ukraine, you can find whatever church you, you want. There are Protestants, Catholics, Orthodox. Uh, the, the palette is quite uh, wide. And this is important because this white palette contributes to religious pluralism and of, of Ukrainians. So to sum up this part of my presentation, what, um, what do we know about Ukraine, about the 30 years of religious revivals in Ukraine? We know that religion was not so important for Ukrainians in the you know, early 90s, but it is quite important today. It's a huge change. Religion is important for many people. Uh, a lot of Ukrainians nominally affiliate with religion. More and more Ukrainians attend churches. They trust the church as an institution. And uh, it actually shapes their political uh, identities and worldviews about what is Ukraine and what is the place of Ukraine in the world. Uh, still, Ukrainians are a bit fluid because we have this enormous pluralistic religious market. We don't have one single national church. Orthodox church is divided in different jurisdictions. They compete with each other. And this influences uh, people because people still cannot decide which uh, they basically they switch sides uh, depending on the year and depending on the circumstances. Um, so uh, what can we uh, say uh, about Ukraine from the high level the sociological theoretical perspective. Well, Ukraine is a fascinating case because everything that I just told you fits very well to what we know about the world from the sociological theory. Sociological theory says that religion usually increases, becomes more important in places with uh, uh, you know, difficult economic uh, transitional periods with some where people are exposed to existential insecurities, where the state is not so strong to provide insurance or public uh, goods. And that's what the case, that definitely was the case for Ukraine during the difficult transition period in the 90s. Uh, the theory also says that religion becomes more and more important when it overlaps with national identities and national narratives, which is again the case for Ukraine. And religions, religion is growing when not only religious supply is growing, but when religious supply is pluralistic. And again, we observe this in the case of Ukraine. And finally, also sociologists, a lot of sociologists like to uh, pay attention to specific uh, 
local context. So when we analyze uh, particular societies, it can be the US, Canada, Ukraine, Bulgaria, whatever. Yes, we can explain a lot by, by this um, cross-national uh, comparative theories, but sometimes it's important to look into the national context as well. And uh, in Ukraine, there are quite a lot of important historical events during these 30 years of, um, of religious development. So in 1991, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, Ukrainian Orthodox Church reemerged. Then we had this creation of the All Religious Groups Council. Then in 2015, uh, the Thomas happened. So Ukraine never stopped experiencing significant events which shaped uh, or um, strengthened their religious life which is quite important for, for, to understand the religious revivals in Ukraine and why they never stop. Uh, so these couple of slides are just uh, references to those who are watching. There are quite a lot of scholars who wrote about that. Ukrainians like Ilyansky, Panich, Marchinka, uh, international scholars, Karpov, Mitrohin, uh, Ukrainian scholar Shistopalyot. So uh, everything that I just said, you can find uh, in their papers uh, that are brilliant papers and I highly advise to, to read all of them. And now I'll, I'll move to the final part of my presentation, which is about consequences. Okay, we know that there are some religious revivals have been going in Ukraine. We also know that religious market is very pluralistic in Ukraine. So what does it mean for us? Uh, can we predict something knowing uh, this information about religious market in Ukraine? And the answer is yes. So we can see that, uh, that uh, church competition and religious pluralism correlates with the political behavior of Ukrainians. On this graph, I plotted uh, the results of the previous presidential elections when Poroshenko was competing with uh, Zelensky. This is a second two results and the data are at the level of precincts. So I was looking in each precinct separately. And, um, and the data is divided, divided here in those local communities that experienced uh, transition of the Orthodox Church versus those that did not experience the transition. What do I mean by transition? Uh, so after Thomas happened, some local communities decided that their local Orthodox Church should change from the Moscow Patriarch affiliation to the new uh, uh, autocephalous Ukrainian Orthodox Church affiliation. So basically these uh, local communities, differently, sometimes it was about community, sometimes it was about the local priest, sometimes it, it was about both, but basically at the local level, people had preferences for more pro-Ukrainian uh, Orthodox Church. And in the same precincts, it seems that people had uh, statistically higher preferences to vote for Poroshenko. So I cannot tell you about causality here, what was uh, the cause and what was the consequence, but at least I can tell that there was a correlation that pref national preferences for the church and preferences for uh, Poroshenko did correlate it in, in these regions. Another thing is uh, how people reacted to COVID and whether church competition and religious pluralism uh, influence reactions of people. Uh, so here uh, I have to say the disclaimer, all the data that I will show you from now on uh, was, um, um, was gathered with a research company Gradus, which works only in urban areas. So this is not representative for all Ukraine, for rural areas, it's only for large cities. Nevertheless, it was my intention to analyze large cities because uh, quite a lot of COVID-related activities were happening in large cities, important uh, events or uh, you know, difficult situations when uh, offices were closed or all the transport stopped going. It was all about urban um, places. So I, I really wanted to analyze the quick response of urban Ukrainians to the COVID. And uh, we were asking them a lot of questions about religion, about economics, about trust to the government. And uh, we did our surveys in 2020 during the Easter, then during just before the Christmas, and then in 2021, again during Christmas. 
And we asked, what do people think about religious practices? Like, should these practices be banned during the pandemic? And we asked whether, what do they think about uh, the tradition to kiss the hand of the priest or to use shared spoon for holy community or to attend churches or to baptize children? So quite obviously, a lot of people uh, suggested that we should ban these practices that are related you know, to physical contact, to hygiene, like it's not okay to kiss the hand of a priest or to consume um, uh, from the shared spoon, uh, Holy Communion. So yeah, people did not like this. But people, quite a lot of people tolerated the idea that, okay, uh, we can still baptize children or gather for memorial services. Uh, what's important here is that there, when people provided their answers, there still was a difference between those who identified with different churches. So some people identified with Moscow Patriarchate, some people identified with this new um, uh, Ukrainian Orthodox Church, and some people said that they are just Orthodox with no, with no label. And usually we observed that people who identified with Moscow Patriarchate, they were quite tolerant to, to religious practices. All other respondents were more likely to ban religious practices, but people uh, who identified fight with Moscow Patriarchate were quite tolerant. But uh, my message is not to shame one particular religious group. I don't want to say that, you know, there are good religious groups in Ukraine and there are bad religious groups. This is not my intention. I would rather suggest that uh, it's about mixed worldviews. Uh, we also observe in our studies that it's not so much about religion per se, but it's about combination of religious identities and national identities. When these two identities are mixed and people become more fundamental in their worldviews, and in the literature it's uh, called uh, Christian nationalism, so people would agree simultaneously that they are quite religious, they believe in God, they attend churches, but also they believe that the Ukrainian state should be, you know, uh, Christian, that Christianity should be taught in, in, uh, in schools, that the government should advocate Christian values, things like that. So when uh, we, can, we can construct this index of Christian nationalism, and we see that it correlates, for example, with anti-vaccination attitudes. So when people are uh, receive a higher score on this index of Christian nationalism, they're also more likely to be anti-vaccine uh, uh, in their attitudes. And this finding was all, well, this finding is not published yet uh, for Ukraine, but similar studies were published uh, about the United States of America, for instance. Uh, there are quite a lot of American scholars who study uh, Christian nationalism. And the findings are quite similar. So I, I think sociologists agree that it's not so much about religion, but it's a fusion of this fundamentalist ideology that religion and nationalism, when they come together, um, they influence the trust to the state, trust to science, trust to uh, leaders in the society. Okay, so uh, to summarize again, I will just repeat what I said, that religion plays a crucial role in Ukraine. A lot of Ukrainians became um, more religious with time. They attend churches. And uh, church competition and religious pluralism is a very big part of the Ukrainian religious sphere. And church competition uh, influences, and I would say it's one of the driving forces of religious revivals in Ukraine because of this pluralism and competitive market, more and more Ukrainians remain to be religious instead of choosing secular alternatives. And also church competition influence other processes such as elections, and uh, experiences during the COVID because people who in this con um, con uh, uh, in the context of competition, people affiliate with different religious groups. So they receive uh, respective messages and this in-group, out-group mechanism influences how they respond to elections or pandemic, et cetera. So 
uh, that's it. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, time and attention. I'll be very happy to talk with you during the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much, Timothy. Uh, would you mind stop sharing your screen at this point uh, since sure. we're ready for questions and uh, uh, comments? Again, um, you can also use our function raise hand if you would like to participate in our discussion as a panelist as well. So um, I would really like to go back to this no notion of being religious, uh, and you commented on, on this concept a lot of uh, quite quite a lot, uh, saying that um, a lot of people would say that they are religious, and uh, uh, one of um, the, uh, one of those facts uh, proves it uh, when you mentioned that eight people out of ten uh, in some eastern parts of Ukraine today would say that they are religious. But um, still, what do they mean when they say I'm religious? Because many people would say I'm religious, but I don't go to church, or I'm not religious, but I do believe in God. Um, so there is this very um, hybrid, maybe, understanding of what religiosity means in Ukraine. And again, of course, it um, points to some pluralism, but it also uh, points, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong in this, but to this distorted perception of what religion is, uh, which took place uh, under the Soviet Union. And there is this sense of discomfort uh, talking about uh, religion, uh, even today, uh, maybe less so. Uh, in some re uh, regions of Ukraine and um, maybe uh, to a higher degree in some other uh, regions. So um, could you, uh, could you uh, talk a little bit more about this notion of being religious and uh, how people in Ukraine um, may interpret it and why? Yeah, so this is quite the universal phenomenon. So what, uh, what you're saying, we can observe in any other European country that uh, nominal identification does not correlate necessarily with uh, behavior. So people can say, I believe in something and identify with this religious group because it's a part of my historical heritage, because my father attended this church or my mother attended this church, but eh, it's more a culture than actual religious belief. Uh, and sometimes people are not educated about religious rituals. So this is all true. I think that uh, it's quite important to keep in mind that in many European countries, the route was, uh, the path was a bit uh, different. It was more organic. Secularization uh, was a very long historical process that emerged in many uh, European societies. So I would say that today, a lot of Europeans, they discover spirituality. They try to understand uh, religious narratives and, and relate to religion, but they they kind of forgot what it means, but in uh, places like Ukraine or Russia, uh, because religion was banned and forbidden for many years, a lot of generations, people from different generations, they were raised when they didn't know anything about religion. So they had to kind of learn it from the scratch. And that's why uh, there are quite a lot of weird hybrid um, beliefs so that's why quite a lot of orthodox people they believe in superstitions simultaneously with uh, uh with kind of traditional religious beliefs so people yeah people discover religiosity and they, they give them uh, they they give different interpretations to religiosity but i would say that in ukraine um first of all this interpretation very much relies on national narratives. So how people understand what is nation, what is the history, what is the role of the state. Uh, perhaps you know this quite common joke in Ukraine that people say it's much better, if you want to be an atheist, it's much better to be an atheist of Kievan Patriarchate than the Moscow Patriarchate. So that's how people uh, interpret religion through the lenses of their national identities. So this is one uh, important thing. And another important thing that I, I, I wanted to, you know, to stress on, on this in my presentation, that uh, it's important to look in the long run. So in, if we look at Ukrainians uh, right now, today, we will just pick some random Ukrainians, the, the picture will be so mixed. Uh, you know, one person is going to say that they're just nominally religious. Other people would say that they're purely religious. So 
it would be very difficult to understand what's happening with in the heads of people. But when we look at Ukraine from the perspective of 30 years, I think we see that more and more Ukrainians are on the path of discovering this quite um, of discovering religion as as it should be. So people discover, people learn about religious practices. People reflect about what religion is. People attend, start attending on religious ceremonies so they understand what does it mean to attend the church during the Easter, uh, during the Christmas, what kind of rituals they, they should learn. So people become gradually more and more educated about religion and about the place of, of religion in society. I would say that in the 90s, it was a bit chaotic, but in 2000s and today it's more... Um, um crystallized uh, than it was mm -hmm. um, yeah thank you thank you timothy and uh we've got a question uh from hiroaki kuromiya what's the situation with protest uh, protestantism in today's ukraine does it assume political implications uh yeah it's it's a it's a very very interesting question so um in terms of uh share of the population, you know, how many Ukrainians practice Protestantism. Usually it's a, it's a minority. According to different surveys, maybe 7%, maybe 10% of Ukrainians can say that they're Protestants. Nevertheless, as the institution, uh, Protestant church as, as the organization is very strong. They are quite active. They are present in all territories of Ukraine. They, they try very hard to be visible, to provide um, aid, to provide uh, sort of financial support, shelter. So it's a, it's a very active organization. And it used to be quite um, de-attached from politics for, for many years. There is a very interesting paper by uh, Panich. Uh, I, I cited her on the slides. So the paper was about Protestants during the Soviet regime that they felt oppressed. And some Protestant groups, they felt that they should be united in this opposition to the Soviet regime. Once Soviet regime collapsed, they did not have uh, the opposition to be united against to. So uh, it really affected their identity and even motivation to, to maintain a religious community. So I would say that a lot of Protestants were apolitical and they did not have uh, uh, a lot of strong opinions about language, history, state. However, this has changed after the Euromaidan. And this uh, change after uh, the war in Donetsk and Luhansk, a lot of Protestants had to leave these territories. Uh, they became internally displaced people. Uh, they were prosecuted in, um, in the so-called uh, Donetsk and Luhansk uh, republics. I remember I was watching the interview of uh, one of the leaders of the so-called Donetsk Republic, uh, Zaharchenko. He was articulating quite clearly that in his personal views, there are only four legitimate groups, uh, uh, traditional groups, Muslims, Jews, uh, Russian Orthodox, and uh, Roman Catholics, which was a strong signal that he did not see Greek Catholics and Protestants as uh, legitimate groups. And there were many reports uh, stating that uh, uh, Protestants were harassed and attacked, so they had to escape. And I think this really influenced uh, their understanding of, uh, of their place in Ukraine. And I think that uh, today more and more Protestants become more engaged with politics and uh, more associated with, uh, with the Ukrainian na nation. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have a follow-up uh, follow question regarding uh, trust. Uh, one of your slides uh, mentioned that um, uh, Ukrainians really trust church. And um, uh, I would like to connect this question to the issue of vaccination rates. And uh, recently I read one of the opinions um, that tried to explain uh, low rates of vaccination in Ukraine. And one of the points they were trying to make was that uh, Ukrainians do not trust the government, the state at all. And it is 
um, it, it can be um, explained to some extent um, by uh, history, um, taking into consideration the Soviet um, uh, strategies. Um, but uh, since you mentioned that Ukrainians trust the church, and uh, I was wondering if um, Ukrainian church is actively involved uh, in uh, this vaccination process, or whether it should be involved in these vaccination endeavors more, or maybe if it's, it is involved, then maybe it shouldn't be involved. So what's, what's your opinion on that? Yeah, so I mentioned this project uh, by Torniki Metrovelev from Lund University. Uh, so within this project, Torniki and I, we collected data uh, about Ukraine and Georgia, and we were um, analyzing the data of official statements uh, of the church in their official documents, synods, uh, synodial documents, and media presence. And from the very beginning, uh, we noticed that there was a very different strategies which the new Ukrainian uh, autocephalous church and the Moscow Patriarchal Church uh, have taken. So they uh, really diverged in their perception of the COVID and the role of the church. So the, in the official statements, the uh, new uh, autocephalous church was very was playing this role of a good cop, basically. They aligned with the state they were saying that uh, COVID is a very big deal. It's serious. We should take uh, the responsibility. And it, you know, if people want, need to stay at home, they should stay at home. You can pray online if you need to. So you don't have to come to church. So it was a very strong position by the church. However, uh, interestingly, that um, it, was all, it can be also understand. In our analysis, we also uh, noticed that it was almost like a bargaining process. So uh, they provided the legitimacy to, to the government and they uh, agreed uh, with the governmental rules. However, in, in, in exchange, they received this uh, uh, basically legitimacy to, to, to be open. You know that many other institutions and organizations were closed during the curfew, but the churches were not closed. Uh, so they, the doors remained open, but they publicly stated that they will take responsibility, that people can stay at home, that they should wear masks, et cetera, et cetera. In the sharp contrast, the Moscow Patriarchate uh, took a very different approach. On the surface, they agreed in their statements that, yeah, coronavirus is a big deal. However, uh, it is important to attend, attend churches uh, because you can save your body and your soul in the church. They summon people for um, cro walking with crosses. Uh, they actually evoke, evoked the narrative of oppression, saying that the, the government wants to close the church, but it's, it's bad, it's non-democratic. So they were very, like, they acted as bad cops in this situation. And uh, I'm not surprised to see in our surveys that people who identify with different churches, they also had different attitudes about safety, health, uh, vaccines. So basically people who identified with the first church, they had this more, uh, I would say, pro-government and more pro-scientific attitude. But people who were mobilized by the Moscow Patriarcha Church, they were quite, um, you know, in line with these narratives, and they, um, well, did not follow the governmental restrictions. So that's what we observed: is that uh, this church competition exacerbated uh, differences in in behaviors of of people. Uh, so in my personal view, I think it's very responsible and it's very important for religious leaders, uh, you know, uh, to take more active uh, stance on the issue of vaccination and the issue of safety. Uh, the church is trusted. People listen to religious leaders nationally, meaning that they watch TV, they listen to radio, they read press, but also locally, they trust to local priests. And it's a huge responsibility. And in my 
personal view as Timothy Briggs, citizen of Ukraine, I would be grateful if religious leaders, uh, you know, can convince people to be more responsible with the health, to wear masks, to vaccinate. And we actually observe it now that, uh, you know, in today, in the um, almost in the end of 2021, uh, the churches became to be more responsible. There are TV commercials when the when priests uh, call for vaccination and uh, and try to calm down people. So I, I think now uh, religious leaders more or less agree that, that they should follow the state regulations. It was not like this a year ago, but now religious uh, groups are quite, uh, they try to follow the governmental uh, suggestions. Right. We've got another question. Um, have there been attempts, like they were in Russia, to outlaw certain religion groups, uh, Morans um, uh, and other groups, either calling them non-historical or extremists or other dangerous or otherwise dangerous, sorry? No, uh, I, I think uh, Ukraine in, in sharp contrast to Russia, did not have such attempts. I mean, in the early 90s, uh, with the um, extreme increase of different religious groups in Ukraine, we also had religious cults that were perceived quite dangerous. A white brotherhood was one of these uh, clans in the early 90s. I think they intervened. Uh, in many other cases, uh, state basically allowed religious groups to, to basically compete with each other. So there were cases in the early 90s when uh, members of different parishes were fighting with each other uh, for, uh, for property. You know, uh, different Orthodox groups were engaged in feast fighting to, to, to decide who is going to own this particular temple. And the state was just looking at it like, okay, you, you guys, you decide. So in this uh, case, uh, the state was often was quite withdrawn from, from uh, strict regulation of religious groups. There were rumors and there were some exacerbated expectations that after the Thomas, after the receiving of this, uh, uh, after the establishment of this new Ukrainian Orthodox church, some people were afraid that the government is going to prosecute the Moscow Patriarchal Church, that they're going either to ban it or maybe to force it to merge with the new church. And it, didn't, it did not happen. So basically, the government never had the legitimacy and resources to, uh, to change the status quo be between, the, between the churches. So... And I think that also um, was one of the reasons why quite a lot of Protestants uh, from the so-called Donetsk and Luhansk republics, they uh, decided to escape it and arrive to Ukraine, but not to Russia, because uh, they knew that they're going to be more welcomed in, in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. um, there is a continuation to this question. Um, are other major world religions that have had a long history in Ukraine, Judaism, Islam, not included in statistics like the ones you have presented because they are too small, less than one yeah. percent of the population? So I will. Um, mm, I should say that there are two types of data which I use in my analysis and which I presented to you. So one data uh, is all about surveys. And so when we are talking about surveys, it is true that we cannot reach uh, some uh, religious groups because as you correctly say, there are minorities of them and we cannot just, due to the limitations of the sample sizes, we cannot reach uh, to all of them. However, another source of the data is about officially registered religious groups. So officially registered parishes. Um, uh, and according to Ukrainian law, uh, religious groups, no one obliges them to register because it would be uh, illegal, but religious groups are encouraged to be registered. They're, they have a lot of incentives to be registered because only with the registration they can receive certain um, benefits, uh, they can pay less taxes, or they can go to the court. For instance, if you have some uh, troubles regarding the property, you, you need to be registered. So uh, that's why a lot of religious groups in Ukraine, they 
go through official registration and all these minorities are registered and they are present in my data for uh, religious organizations. So yeah, Judaism, Islam, even um, some uh, Eastern religious, uh, Buddhism, um, uh, what else? It could be um, um, uh, like old style Orthodox, uh, pagans. So all these are present in my statistical data, but not survey data. Well, thank you so much, Timothy. We're running out of our time. Uh, well, again, thank you for your wonderful uh, presentation today. And thank you for this talk that complicates the notions of religion and identity uh, and all this, um, uh, I would say, political even transformations uh, in Ukraine. Um, I apologize. I think we got uh, either a comment uh, or... Okay, sorry. Well, um, I'll uh, take a pause here and I'll just read out this last uh, last question that I noticed. Um, okay. Where will be? Oh, okay. Where will be the recording available? Yes, the recording will be available on our YouTube channel. Apologies uh, for that. Yes. Well, again, uh, thank you so much for this uh, talk, and um, it's quite compelling um, to think about religious uh, pl pluralism, as you pointed to, uh, pointed out today, as a way to explore one's uh, identity and uh, one's self, um, not only in terms of religion, but also in terms of uh, political identities, in terms of probably circular identities, uh, circular identities as well. So thank you so much for this uh, wonderful uh, conversation today, Timothy. Uh, thank you very much for having me. I know that you will host another meeting soon about uh, revivals in Ukrainian language. So I look forward to attending that event as well. As, yes, as next a listener. week. <laughs> next week. Thank you. And thank you, Timothy. Yeah. Uh, Timothy Brief presented bye. today on 30 years of religious pluralism in Ukraine from early revivals to the pandemic. Uh, thank you for attending our lecture. Information about upcoming events will be available on our Ukraso listserv and on our Facebook page, Ukrainian Studies Organization at Indiana University. Uh, you can view uh, our today's lecture and previous lectures on our YouTube uh, channel. Thank you again for uh, being with us today.